We're doing Brownie Space Science Adventure, and this badge has five steps, okay? And we're going to do step three and step four on the live, and I'm going to give you some tips and some cool YouTube videos and things that you can do so you can finish all the other steps and get this uh, whole badge knocked out. So the first step is meet the neighbors. So our solar system is kind of like a giant neighborhood, and the planets could be different things that live next door to each other, all right? Um, so to meet the neighbors, you kind of have to learn about each planet, and then what you're going to do is you're going to make a mnemonic, um, or an acronym is what a mnemonic is, out of the first letter of each planet in, in order, and that will help you remember where they are in the solar system and how they work. Um, so there's a cool video that's in the description that actually is a song, and it gives you a little bit about each planet. It does skip Pluto because it obviously is part of the people that believe Pluto is not a planet. Pluto, it was decided about 10 years ago that Pluto was a dwarf planet, um, so they don't always count it, but there's a NASA director who came out recently this last year and said, no, Pluto's a planet, and NASA says so. So we're going to go with NASA, so I still count Pluto as a planet. Um, so you're going to make a, your own mnemonic. You'll watch the cool YouTube video of the song so you can learn a little bit about each of the planets. Um, my mnemonic is my very earthling mother just served us nine pizzas. I learned that in grade school. It is stuck in my head, so acronyms do work for learning things. So I know that M is Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, the dwarf planet. So you're going to create your own. Think of the letters. I kind of put them in the description. And make up your own acronym and even if you want to make up your own little song about the planets, but first watch the video that's in the description because it gives you some cool information about each of the planets. And we're here to learn because that's what we do for badges. We learn and we build skills. So that's step one, learn a little bit about all of the planets that are in the solar system and meet the neighbors, okay? So then step two is see more than before. So what they want you to do is kind of when we're standing on the ground looking up at the sky, we can't see a lot. We see stars as these tiny specks, we see comets. Um, they want you to look closer at all of the things that are outside of Earth's atmosphere. So you can either, um, if you have binoculars, you could go out at night and kind of look up, but you can also, if you have access to a telescope, or when we're no longer social distancing, there's a lot of cool places that you can go and look through a telescope at science museums and things, so you could do that later. Um, but one of the things they also tell you can do is you can use your computer to look closer. So you can look up images that have been taken from different telescopes. You can look up NASA images that they have of all the different cool nebulas and things. So they want you to look more closely at the sky. Um, so that's what you have to do for step two, is see more than before. You got to explore the solar system up close. You can use your computer, or if you have access to binoculars and a telescope, you can go outside at night and you can do that part of it as well. Okay, so that was step two. And then step three, actually I won't pull that off yet. Step three is investigate the moon. So you need to learn more about that thing that orbits Earth, okay? This is our only natural satellite. So man has made a whole bunch of satellites that are up in space orbiting, orbiting the Earth, but the moon is the only one that naturally occurs. And it is a pretty cool thing. So like, uh, like Earth, the moon has mountains, okay? And they call them things like the lunar Alps, which are kind of like, we just picked names of mountain ranges down here and put them up on the moon as well, okay? And then the moon also has a lot of impact craters, which are kind of like giant ditches from when things crashed into the moon, like asteroids or comets that have collided with it, all right? And it has no atmosphere or weather, so that surface kind of remains, you know, if you, Neil Armstrong, when he gets off of, he comes out and he puts his boot down and there's that boot print, that's kind of still there, because even this many years later, the moon doesn't have any weather to change it. So um, the surface, once something hits it and creates an impact crater, it's still there a really long time later. So it has some really cool, well-preserved terrain, all right? And then it has the large, flat parts of the moon when you see it, when you look at it and you're like, what's the dot? What's that light part? What's the dark part? So those large, dark, flat-looking parts, those are planes. And actually, most of them have interesting names because a long time ago, um, ancient Greeks, ancient Romans, when they were looking up at the moon, they thought those were oceans and seas. So the names of some of those large, flat planes are things like um, 
the sea of serenity or the sea of showers because they thought water was there. Um, but now we know that there is no water on the moon, but we still call it the sea of serenity, even though it's not a sea, it's a large flat plain. Okay. So there's mountains, there's plains, and there's craters on the moon. So the craters actually have fun names. Um, some of them are named the Plato Crater, who's an old ancient Greek philosopher. He got his own crater on the moon, which is pretty cool. There's an Aristotle crater, Archimedes, Copernicus. So some famous scientists and philosophers got moon craters named after them, which I think is pretty nifty. All right, so one of the things you have to do for step three is investigate the moon, and you have to create your own artistic representation of the moon. So you could make a painting of the moon, you could make it out of paper mache. What we're gonna do today, because I did not have all of that stuff, we're gonna make it out of food. So we're gonna take an English muffin. And if you look at an English muffin, it has like crags and valleys and it kind of like, it looks like craters have hit it. It's a very pitted surface, all right? We can smooth it out. You can use a nut butter, you could use cream cheese. Um, so this is going to be part of our moon. We're going to put some peanut butter on it. And it doesn't have to be smooth. You can make crests and weird fun things in it because it's the moon surface and that's not, not perfectly flat. And then you need something to kind of represent all those craters and mountains and plains. So what I picked, and this is part of, it was in the badge book, it says make a moon cake. This isn't quite cake, but we're going to go with it. Is you can get bananas. Those can be giant craters if you want. I'm going to name this giant crater Copernicus, and this one will be Aristotle, okay? And then there are little craters, there are mountains and valleys, so you can get, these are Apple Jacks, but you can use Cheerios or any other kind of interesting cereal. You can add them in there to kind of make the weird, fun-looking surface that you see when you look at the moon. So this is my moon, all right? And I made it pretty quickly, so you can make a very artistic one if you want, and then it's edible, which is always the fun part about making an artistic representation out of food. You can eat it later, so if you didn't have lunch, this would be an interesting lunch. Bananas, peanut butter, English muffin, and Apple Jacks. Okay, so you're going to make some sort of artistic representation of the moon. If you have other foods at home that you think would be really fun, definitely use those, and then take Take a photo and post it, because I want to see what you guys made, because I think they're going to be very cool. And let me move this out of the way so I don't accidentally knock the food off. I did do that earlier. I dropped something in the plate of Apple Jacks. They flew all over the room. It was great. All right, so that was step three. We've investigated the moon. We've learned that it has mountains, and it has plains, and it has craters that have cool names. And it just looks different. It doesn't always look the same. If you look up tonight, um, and then next week, it might change a little bit. So there is an activity that we did in the DAISY Space Science Badge, which is where you take Oreo cookies, and you actually like scrape them so they look like the different shapes of the moon, like a crescent or a waning gibbous. And there is a link to that, if I remember to put it. If not, I will put it in there later. Yep, you can make the moon using sandwich cookies. There's a link to kind of a worksheet that explains like what's a waning gibbous, what it looks like when it's a waxing crescent, and you can use that to make your own different different phases of the moon. It's a good fun activity, okay? So that was step three, investigate the moon. So we are gonna move on in my lovely outline to step four. This is be a stargazer, okay? And the stars, if you didn't know, the stars in the constellations, um, many of them have had names and they have stories. Um, before people could read or use technology, they told stories. And the stories about the constellations and the stars and where they were placed in the sky helped them share information, but also helped them figure out what time of year it was. Um, sometimes it was practical, like you used a con the constellation. If you kept this constellation to, your, to the north, you could navigate on it on a ship or something like that. Um, and sometimes it was for things like agriculture. When the Pleiades are, um, disappearing from the horizon, it's time to do this on the farm. And we'll actually talk about that in just a minute. Um, and they used famous people and famous stories, and they would imagine that they were up in the sky. So, kind of like, you know, Lion King Mufasa and all the famous kings that are all watching Simba from the sky, that's what they thought. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about one of my favorite constellations and the kind of the story behind it and what it was used. And then you guys all get to make up your own constellation story. So, oh, the loveliness of working from home. All right, so we've got the Pleiades. So who are the Pleiades? All right, the Pleiades are also called the Seven Sisters, and there are seven stars. Sometimes you can't see all seven. Some of them are brighter than others, but there's usually seven that are kind of part of this. So the Pleiades are seven sisters, and they're pretty cool. Um, they are part of Taurus the Bull constellation, but I think they're cooler, so we're telling their story. But they're in the Greek mythology. This is seven divine sisters, daughters of Pleione, okay? And they were companions of Artemis, who is the goddess of the moon and the hunt. So they were pretty cool, and they did a lot of cool different things, but really they're famous because we named stars after them. Okay, and the Pleiades were primarily, if you were Greek, you looked up at the Pleiades and you thought, okay, these are visible and they're really easy to find in the winter. So if you saw the Pleiades up in the sky and they usually started appearing for them in October and November, that meant that it was time to put the boats up because summer is over, okay? And it's time to plow and plant things because autumn in Greece is the time when you actually start planting um, things in the ground. So agriculture would use the Pleiades when they started to appear like, oh, it's time to start planting all the seeds, okay? And they actually have another name. There's a lot of different cultures beyond just the ancient Greeks that named the Pleiades because they're very bright and they're easy to see and they're a cluster of stars. Um, the Zuni tribe in New Mexico actually called them the seed stars. And they have a different agricultural season. They have a different farming season than you would if you lived in Greece because that's the Mediterranean versus you know North America, okay? Because for them, the seed stars or the Pleiades, they sort of, they disappear in the spring. Um, so they're there in the winter in the sky, October, November, and they kind of, move around the sky, but they, you can't see them as well as soon as spring starts. So the Zuni knew that as soon as this Pleiades disappeared, it was time to plant seeds because this was their farming season. So that's why they called them the seed stars. So they used the stars to tell a really cool story and then they named them. And actually each of these stars in the Pleiades is named after one of the seven sisters. I don't always remember all of their names except for Electra, I remember Electra. Um, so she's one of my favorites, but they kind of look like a little bit like a little dipper, but it's pointed and it has a little hat on it. So sometimes when you're looking at the constellations, you're like, how did they get a, Taurus the bull is my favorite to look at and go, how did they get a bull out of those stars? So sometimes they look like what you think, and sometimes you're not quite sure. I think they were reaching when they made that constellation up. But where do you find the Pleiades? So here's the next. Orion actually is a constellation that helps people find where the Pleiades are. So Orion was a famous hunter in Greek mythology, same as the Pleiades. They were part of the same pantheon of mythology. And Orion, if you look, he's got his, he's hunting, so he's got his arm raised, but he's also got a bow, okay? And then he has a belt. And the easiest way to find Orion is to find those three stars that are right next to each other and kind of form a little line. And that's Orion's belt. And that's usually how I find Orion, because I'm like, where? Oh, I can find the belt. And then I can see all the rest of the stars that they think are part of Orion. But the belt actually points to the Pleiades. Um, and it actually, Taurus the bull is this constellation as well. But the Pleiades are part of Taurus. And so if you look, if you look for Orion's belt and you go this way, you will see a cluster of really bright stars that are close together that are called the Pleiades. So that is that constellation story. All right, so what you are going to do, because there are many constellation stories. There are the ones that I primarily picked a couple from the Greek, um, the ancient Greek pantheon, because that's ones we know and that's ones we talk about. But as I said, the Zuni have their own constellation stories. If you look at different cultures, they had different stars that they would name different things and they all would have different stories about them. So it's pretty cool that all across different cultures, we all like to look up at the sky and make up stories and kind of make our own legends and put them into the stars. So what your job for this one is, step four, to be a stargazer, is you need to make up your own star story, okay? 
and you need to make your own constellation. How do you make your own constellation? Well, this is where you need a marker. I had stickers that look like stars, but if you don't have any stickers, you can use anything you have that you're like, this is gonna be this star. It can be sequins. It can just be cool colored dots with your crayons. You're gonna make a constellation. I made my constellation from a story that I love. All right, here we go. This is the Golden Snitch constellation. Are there any Harry Potter fans out there? I really think that this, this should be something that's elusive. It's in the sky and you can only really see it at certain times of years, like most constellations. So I kind of put little stars in it and then I drew lines so that I could see what I thought this stitch would look like. Yeah, one of my stars is coming up. But that is step four. So you get your markers, get your crayons out, and design whatever shape you want. When we've done this at camp, I've seen constellations that girls made in the shape of hearts. I've seen rainbows. I've seen comic book characters. I've seen unicorn constellations, which are fabulous. Um, so whatever story that you think that you would want to see in the stars, if you were an ancient astronomer and you wanted to name your own constellation, what would it be? I want you to make one up and then I want you to take a picture and I want to see it because half the fun of these programs is getting to see all the really cool things that you guys make. All right, so you're going to make your own constellation for step number four and then let me pull up step five so I don't forget what it is. Oh, step five is you need to celebrate and share. So you've learned about the planets. You've learned a acronym for how to remember all their names in the order that they're in. You'll have learned about, um, you'll just be a stargazer. You learned about stars. You learned about the moon and kind of made your own representation of it. So what you need to do is you need to host a space party. Now, right now, it's hard to host a space party unless you have a bunch of siblings and you're like, you guys are all invited to my space party because we live together. All right. But really, for a space party, you need to share what you learned with somebody. And then you can eat space-themed food. You can make your own. You can make up different. You can just eat Oreo cookies that you've scraped icing off of and call it, yep, I think that was space-themed. Okay? And look at the stars together. So it can be a really simple party. Um, you can do it. You could do it over Zoom with some family members. Ask your grandma to join you via Zoom for a face a space party and tell her all the things you've learned and show her your constellation, tell her the story, eat some space food with her, and then you've done step five where you celebrate all you learned about space, you shared it with somebody else, you could share it with your household, sit dad down over dinner and show him all the things that you've learned and you made, it'll be wonderful. Um, or share it with someone younger than you so they're also learning about space. So that is step five celebrate and share. All right, so let me go through the steps really quick so that you guys know kind of what they are and what you're doing. Thank you for joining today. Um, I'll check back later and make sure there are no questions that I am missing. Okay, so step one, meet the neighbors. So you need to look for, find facts out about each of the planets and then make your own acronym for the first day. First letter of each of the planets. So if I remember mine, it's lying on the floor. My very earthly mother just served us nine pizzas. Helps me remember the order that the planets are in. Okay, so you can make your own or you can just learn one. All right, you can see more than before. So that's where you have to go outside with binoculars or a telescope and look at the stars. Or you can use your computer and look at like telescope images that NASA has taken or other organizations. So you can look at nebulas. The cat's eye nebula is super cool looking. Okay, so do that. Then you need to investigate the moon. So you need to learn about the moon, which we did in this video, and then make something that looks like the moon. We made a moon piece of food. You can totally do that. Okay, then you need to be a stargazer. So you need to make up your own star story and kind of space it out and draw out your own constellation. So that's step four. And then celebrate and share. So talk about what you learned with somebody, share some cool facts, have a space party. Okay, and then you are done and you have earned the Brownie Space Science Ed Ooh, was there? Brownie Space Science Adventure badge. Okay?
So thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you had fun. I